Welcome to the third episode talking about representation theory of discrete groups. And today we're going to be talking about what it means for a representation to be faithful. Starting with the definition, we have that a representation rho is faithful if the kernel of rho is simply the identity. Another way to say that is that if rho maps one of our group elements to the identity matrix, that group element better be the identity from that group. This has to be true for all G in our group. And of course, rho is a representation, so it's mapping from G to GLNF. It's all the standard facts of rho being a representation. So you can categorize representations into two different groups. There's a lot of different ways that you can break up representations, but one is as faithful or unfaithful. Or as one of my friends likes to say, faithful and slight. The first thing I'd like to do is prove a fact about faithful representations. So for this proof, we're going to need to assume that the order of our group is finite. And yes, my infinities look like little bow ties. You're going to need to get used to that. As you can tell by my Canadian tuxedo, these bow ties are the last bit of class I have left in my life. So here we have the definition of the kernel, right? The kernel of a map, in this case our map is a representation, is all the elements in the domain, right, all the things we plug into our map, that get mapped to the identity on the output, right? So all the group elements we plug into our representation that come out on the other side as the identity matrix. Another way to say this is that our representation is injective. These are two ways of saying the exact same thing. It's one to one. Now recall that the kernel of a homomorphism, representations are always homomorphisms, is a normal subgroup of that group. And if we have a normal subgroup, we can define the quotient group of our group with that normal subgroup. And I learned this as the second isomorphism theorem. It's one of the isomorphism theorems. Either way, it's a math fact. I'm gonna go back and actually prove this result. Prove that the kernel of a homomorphism is always a normal subgroup. Now technically, this is prerequisite material, right? This is just group theory. This isn't representation theory. But I'm already planning on using this twice in one video. If you haven't caught on, I use this for prerequisite material that I just don't feel like proving. But I find that this proof is satisfying and it goes over a couple of interesting properties of homomorphisms that will be useful when we work with representations because again, they are homomorphisms. So we'll start off by assuming some element H is in the kernel of rho. I'm gonna stick with rho for representation, but this proof does work for a general homomorphism. And let's consider what happens when we conjugate H, right? A normal subgroup is a subgroup that is invariant under conjugation, right? For all G in our group, if we do this for all H in our subgroup, if this conjugate, this, this product here of G inverse HG, if that is again in the kernel, then we have that the kernel is invariant under conjugation and is therefore a normal subgroup. If we start by using the homomorphism property of our representation, we can take the product before mapping and write it as the product after mapping. But rho of H is simply the identity because it's in the kernel. In a more general proof, this should just be the identity. I'm sticking with the matrix identity because this is a video series on representation theory. So the identity goes away and then we can use the property of homomorphisms where we can pull out powers in a sense. And so we pull out the inverse and we have rho of G that is some element, like this will be a matrix, if we're thinking of representations, that's the sum matrix inverse times some matrix. Well, you bet your bottom dollar that that is gonna cancel out and we're gonna get the identity, but hey, the identity is just rho of H because we know that it's in the kernel. So we've shown that the kernel is invariant under conjugation and is therefore a normal subgroup of our group G. So returning to our second isomorphism theorem, we have this equation right here. But if we assume that the kernel is trivial, then we're modding out, we're quotienting out by a subgroup, a normal subgroup that only has one element. So when you quotient out by just the identity, you're just left with the group. So if our kernel is trivial, then we have that a group is isomorphic to the image of our homomorphism. Right, the image of our representation. Our group is isomorphic to the set of matrices that get mapped to under our representation. But I wanna go one step further and show that this is an if and only if statement. Now we're gonna go the opposite direction. We're gonna assume G is isomorphic to the image of rho, our representation, and that means that the order of G has to be equal to the order of the image, right? Our original group, the order of the original group has to be equal to the order of the set of matrices that we're using to represent this group. Now, I'm gonna hit you with another math fact, which comes from Lagrange's theorem if you wanna prove it, but if you have a quotient group like this, the order of 
these three groups involved has to follow this fraction. Right? When you have a quotient group, this, this is not a fraction, this is just notation. This is an actual fraction of a natural number divided by a natural number has to equal another natural number. This is my math fact. And this is why we needed to assume that the order of G was finite, right? If you have infinities coming in all over the place, you might get yourself into trouble. Provided that everything here is finite, if we plug this in over here, we're going to find that the kernel of our representation has to have order one, right? It has only one element in it. So if the kernel has one element, that is what it means for the kernel to be trivial. So we've just proven that this is an if and only if statement, that the kernel is trivial if and only if G is isomorphic to the image of rho. Put another way, because recall, the kernel is trivial is what it means for our representation to be faithful. We have that a representation is faithful if and only if G, our group, is isomorphic to the image of the representation. That's saying that all the information about our group is exactly contained in the image of the isomorphism, the set of matrices that we get out on the other side, right? This is just injective. It's not a bijection. We couldn't have a bijection, right? This is discrete and the group of linear matrices is continuous. The group of matrices isn't finite and a lot of the groups we're working with aren't finite either, right? We don't want G to be isomorphic to the group of general linear matrices. We just want it to be injective. And when it is injective, we have a copy of our group over here represented as matrices. And that's what we mean when we say row is faithful. It tells us everything exactly about G. And to bring back an example from before, we had this representation of D8, the symmetries of a square. And if you look at it, you'll see that the only element that gets mapped to the identity by our homomorphism, right, our representation, is the identity. So this is an example of a faithful representation. So I hope that gave you a solid idea of what faithful representations are. My next video is just gonna be me working through some examples of representations and checking some properties, and hopefully that will make it even more clear what's going on with what a representation is and some of these basic properties like equivalent representations and faithful representations. So that's it for this video. If you found it helpful, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below. I'll make sure that I'll get back to you and I'll see you next time.